Hello guys, I hope you're having a great day today. So again, here we are in nursing pharmacology and we are going to start our discussion for today about principles of drug administration. So let's start out with the first topics under this chapter of pharmacology. So the first one would be um, with regards to the rights of drug administration. So to provide uh, the right drug ad or safe drug administration, we nurses, we should practice the rights of drug administration. And they are the following. So number one, the right client. Number two, the right drug. Three, the right dose. Four, the right time. And five, the right route of administration. And there are also five additional rights. So we need to indicate this as well in our nursing practice, this, since this is also essential for our professional nursing practice. One, the right assessment, because it's one of the rights that we need to do on our patients to assess. For example, if the patient has drug allergies, there are any untoward reaction to the drug and so on. Number two is the right documentation. So after we give or administer a drug to our patient, it is very, very important to document it on the patient's chart. Number three, the client's right to education. So if the patient is going to be discharged and there are some medications that the patient is going to bring home with him, there are certain things that we need to educate the patient about, about how to take this medication, when to take it. There are some foods that the patient may avoid and so on. Number four, the, the right evaluation, of course. Whenever we give a medication, the nursing process is always there minutes or an hour after giving a medication, it is our job to evaluate whether the patient is reacting positively or not to the medication that was administered. And of course, lastly, number five, the client's right to refuse. Because there are certain clients that, are, um, that may refuse certain drugs because they believe uh, about religious practices and so on. So it is very, very important to, uh, to consider this as well because it is their right to refuse the drug. First, we'll talk about the uh, five rights first of drug administration. We'll talk about the first one, which is the right client. So the right client needs to be insured by checking the wristband. So we need to check the patient's wristband for their name, and by checking a second piece of identification, this can be a picture on the patient's chart, or a case number that should be on the chart of the patient and also on the wristband of the patient. And this should be done, of course, before. Take note, this is done before any medication is administrated or administered. Because it's too late to check for the patient's identification if you already gave it afterwards. So always check the right client before giving the drug. That is very, very important. Next, the right drug, of course. For the right drug, this means that the client receives the drug that was prescribed by either a physician, dentist, podiatrist, or an advanced practice nurse with the license to write prescriptions, APRNs. There are nurses that can prescribe. And uh, in America, they have these kinds of nurses who has the power to prescribe medications. So the use of computerized systems to record medications has helped to decrease medication errors because that is very common among hospitals. Since nurses are not trying to read written forms of the prescriptions, doctors can electronically add a new medication order to a patient chart from any location. 
So with the use of technology nowadays, we have smartphones, we have computers, we have software, wherein the doctor can prescribe medications from it remotely. For example, they're at home, they're on call. The nurses can view them on the computer at the nurse's station. And if there is a phone order or verbal order, it must be co-signed by the prescribing physician within the next 24 hours. That is also important to uh, us nurses. Whenever there's a verbal order or a telephone order, the physician should sign it once he or she is already available at the ward where you are working at. Now we go to the components of a drug order. We need to check for the date and time the order was written by the doctor. The drug name, generic is, the generic name is the preferred drug name. The drug dosage, so how much, how many milligrams, for example, are you going to administer to the patient? And of course, the route of administration, whether it be oral, IV, IM, subcutaneous, and so on. Frequency and the duration of the administration. So, for example, the patient needs to take an antibiotic for seven days, three days, or three times a day, or any special instructions for withholding or adjusting dosage based on nursing assessment, drug effectiveness, or laboratory results. So, for example, if the drug um, causes, let's say, blood discretious blood problems, then the nurse need to write it down for the doctor to be informed later on once the doctor is present. Also, the physician or other health healthcare provider's signature or name, if it was the order was done by a telephone order or a verbal order. That's what I've said earlier. And signatures of licensed practitioners taking TO or VO is needed once they are available. If any of these components are missing, the entire order is incomplete and the medication should not be given. Okay, so if any of these are not present in the drug order, do not give the drug. It is your right not to give it because... Your license here is on the line. If you give the drug with a missing component, component of the drug order. Now to avoid errors, we nurses must check the bottle against the order for the medication three different times. And when are we going to do them? At the time of contact with the bottle or container. So once the bottle or container of the drug is already with us. And before pouring the drug as well. And lastly, after you pour the drug. So drugs given for the first dose, one time or as needed medications for Renata should always be checked against the original order. And Nurses, beware of medications that sound alike, and we need to read the labels carefully. There are examples that I have here of medications that sound alike. Let's say, for example, Percocet, Percocet which contains oxycodone and acetaminophen. Percodon contains also oxycodone, but contains aspirin. Percodon should not be given to someone who has an adverse effect or adverse reaction to aspirin. So you need to take note of the different drug medications. You need to check the spelling, the words of the drug, if they sound alike. Nursing implications that of right drug that uh, we need to check or follow. Number one. Check that the medication order is complete and legible. That's what I've mentioned earlier. Number two, know why the client is receiving the medication. Know the client's diagnosis. It's the chief complaint. Number three, check the drug label three times before administration. That's what I've mentioned earlier. And number four, know the start date that the drug 
was ordered and the ending date. Say, for example, the doctor order, ordered the, the patient or ordered a drug for the patient to take for one week. So you need to know when's the start date and when is the end date. One week is seven days. So you need to know if it'll start Monday and end on Sunday. Now we go to four categories of drug orders. We have the standing order. We have the one-time single dose. So there are certain antibiotics that a doctor can give at a single dose. And like that of standing orders, it can take for a week, 14 days, and so. While the third type of drug order would be PRN or prorenata, or in um, English terms, it's as needed. Like for example, pain relievers, pain medications, they can be given if the patient needs it, if the patient only feels pain, for example. Number four, stat at once. Give a shot of epinephrine, stat. So it should be given immediately, most especially during emergency situations. Now we go to the right dose. The right dose is the dose prescribed for a particular client. The nurse is responsible for questioning any dose that looks too high or too low. That is also one of our responsibilities. If you see that the doctor's order somehow is strange, probably it has too high or too low, it is also our right to question it. We should be assertive when it comes to medications in order to avoid any errors. Always consult a peer or a pharmacist if the dosage appears incorrect. So you need to consult with your fellow nurses at the ward or a pharmacist if one is available. And beware of pediatric doses that are based on body weight. Sometimes doctors can also have miscalculations. You need to triple check those things. Weight can change daily, so regular assessment of dosages is also crucial. Nursing implications of right dose. We need to calculate the drug dose correctly. I'll teach you how to do those calculations in our next topic. For some medications, two nurses are needed to sign off a new order such as heparin or insulin. And check, check for the PDR, the American Dr Hospital Formulary Drug Package Inserts or any other drug references for recommended range of specific drug dosage. You can check the internet for it. It's very, our smartphones nowadays are very handy to check for the average dose of a certain drug or the package inserts, which is already there. If uh, the drug was given to you before administering it, check the package inserts. Now we go to the right time. Right time is the time at which the prescribed do dose should be administered. It is also present in the doctor's order. So we need to be careful of the time when we are going to administer the drug to the patient. Nursing implications of the right time. Administer drugs at specified times. Drugs may be given 0.5 hour or after the time prescribed if the administration interval is more than two hours. So that would be given either 30 minutes or before or after the drug is going to be administered as long as the uh, interval is more than two hours. Number two, administer drugs that are affected by foods before meals, such as tetracyclines. So you need to know those type of drugs that you need to give before meals. Also, for number three, you need to know drugs that you, can, you should give after meals because some drugs, they can irritate the stomach or the gastric mucosa, such as aspirin or potassium. So you need to know also these drugs. Also, drug administration schedule can sometimes be flexible in order to accommodate the client's activities for the day or preferences. So you need to check with the physician with regards to the schedule as well if the drug can be adjusted or the schedule can be adjusted. Number five, 
it is our responsibility to be aware of tests or procedures that are taking place that may affect the medication administra administration. So let's say, for example, passing blood tests, endoscopy, so you need to check those as well. If there are any diagnostic procedures that can affect the administration of the drug. Check also for the ad, uh, expiration date of medications and return it to the pharmacy if it is already expired. Number seven, antibiotics need to be given evenly over 24 hours as opposed to TID. Uh, the doctors should also need to take note of the drug's half-life, especially for antibiotics. Next right is the right route. The right route is nece necessary for adequate and appropriate absorption. So we nurses, we need to know the basics of the routes of administration. And there are certain nursing implications about this. So number one, we need to assess the client's ability to swallow before administering oral drugs. Because if the drug for our, the, if the patient is a stroke patient, for example, then there will be a problem in the administration of the drug, oral drugs. Number two, do not crush or mix medications into other substances before consultation with the pharmacy. Do not also mix medications into sweetened juices for kids or add to formula for babies. We need to follow all medication administration guidelines for that specific drugs. Because there are certain drugs that can be um, inactive when mixed with certain beverages. So you need to check for the drug food interaction first before making any um, drug mixes. Number three, use a septic technique when administering drugs, uh, drugs most especially if they are given through IV, IM, subcutaneous and uh, use sterile technique when administering, most especially these forms are roots of administration when giving parenteral meds. Number four, administer drugs to appropriate sites. So you need to know the different sites of administration. I'll show you them here later on. Number five, stay with the client until oral meds have been swallowed. If your patient is a psych patient, you need to check for the oral cavity if the patient has truly swallowed the drug. Check the buccal areas, the lingual area before letting the patient leave. Number six, if it's necessary to combine a medication with another substance, explain this to the patient. So you need to explain certain things why you need to mix drugs. Now we go to the forms and routes of administration. Oral, which includes buccal and sublingual, uh, the different forms can be in the form of tablet, capsules, orally disintegrating tablets, the chewables, buccal tablets, sublingual tablets, mini tablets, pervescent tablet, thin films, dedicated gums, granules, crochets, lozenges, solutions, suspensions, emulsion, elixirs, and buccal sprays. But for the parenteral route, most of these are injectables. You have the IM or intramuscular, subcutaneous, intradermal, and the fastest route of administration is the IV, intravenous. You also have inhalation um, the, uh, through administration of dry powders and liquid sprays. Nasal, through drops or sprays as well. Otic. Otic, this is pertaining to the ears. So either topical, intratympanic, or intracochlear. Intratympanic if it's um, within the tympanic membrane. Cochlear, of course, with the cochlea. You also have ocular for the eyes. You can uh, administer solutions, emulsions, suspensions, ointments, contact lenses, implants, inserts, and intravitreal. So it's inside the vitreous humor. 
topical or transdermal, we have ointments, creams, lotions, gel, sprays, and even patches. Let's say, for example, if you have fungal infection, you have creams or ointments that can help treat it. And rectal or vaginal, in the forms of support, uh, suppository, enema, tablets, pessary, gel, cream, foams, and sponges. So these are the forms and routes of administration. I'm sure you've known these forms and routes since you were in first year. Now we go to the medication safety tips. Number one tip to provide safety drug administration would be to avoid distractions. The hospital can be full of interruptions and distractions. In fact, several studies have concluded that these factors account to around 45 to 50% of medication errors. So distractions are real within the hospital, most especially if you have a lot of patients. So what we need to do as nurses is to focus. Distractions during medication preparation and administration can cause errors. So we need to focus when we are preparing things. Distractions such as ringing telephones, alarming call bells, short-tempered patients, all of these things can easily disrupt your focus. Even your co-nurses and patients can take your mind off things with what you are doing. So because these factors are hard to eliminate altogether, reaching an agreement with your colleagues can help. So you need to talk, out, talk it out with your colleagues, your co-workers, nurses at the nurse station that when you're preparing drugs, you need to avoid certain distractions. You can also ask them to handle patients' concerns as you focus in, on preparing and administering the due medications. Because it's important to focus, check, calculate the drug dosages. And once it's also their turn to administer drugs, offer to attend to your patients' other needs. And number two, know your R's, the R's that we've all been talking about in this lecture. The right to drug administration. They're not hard to memorize. And putting them into practice, however, can be a different story, particularly if it's the first time you're administering a medication. And the anxiety, fear, and tension can easily put you at risk of committing an error. So if you're a student nurse and it's the first time for you to administer a drug, Know your R's and seek help from your clinical instructor when giving medications. Because of this vulner vulnerability, certain hospitals implement policies to help new nurses hone their skills without risking the welfare of their patients. So if you're a new nurse at that hospital, you need to seek assistance from your senior nurses. Know the 10 rights of drug administration. You should memorize that by now. Number three, always ask and counter check. Don't assume that you know things so well at the ward that you're going to give the drug very confidently. That is a bad practice. Do not assume um, drug orders or drug administrations we always need to ask and counter check. More often than not, medication errors involve miscommunication and false assumptions. You can read your doctor's handwriting. There's nothing wrong in verifying it with the doctors. We all well know that the handwriting, some of the handwriting of physicians can be very bad that it is we are not able to read them. Getting shouted at by an annoyed doctor is better than having a dead patient in front of us. It's very, very important for us to ask what the prescription is. It is standard practice to, for, uh, for another nurse to recompute and double check it as well. In case you are unsure or unsure about your calculations, we need to recompute and double check it. Any miscalculation can lead to potentially debilitating effects on your patient. So you need to counter check, double check all of these things, most especially the drug dosages. Number four, 
stay updated. With a very busy, sh uh, busy shift, it can be hard to keep up with every update doctors write on your patient's chart. But one of the best ways you can address this is through a process called as a medication reconciliation. It involves creating a complete, li complete list of medications your patient is receiving and constantly updating the list as transition of care happens or if there are any changes in his medication chart. Most especially, we nurses, we need always to check the patient's medication list on the patient's chart. Because every now and then there are new prescriptions that, are doc that the doctor is making. So for example, it's your off day and you're still going to attend to the same patient when you come back to work. You need to be updated for any new prescriptions that the doctor might prescribe for the patient. Number five, label properly. Each hospital has its own policy when it comes to labeling medications. Generally, however, it's a universal practice to keep every syringe, vial, or container properly labeled to avoid the medication error. So we need to label containers or vials, even syringes, um, in order to properly know what the medication or what type of medicine or drug that we are going to administer to each of our patients. Label your ports and medications as well. Make it a point to label every syringe or container that has a medication in it, even bowls, catheters, and receptacles have labels on them just to make sure. And number six, report. In case an error does happen, make it a point to report the incident. Notify all the members of the health team in charge of the patient's care as well as the hospital safety committee. So if any errors have been made, it is our duty to report it immediately. I repeat, immediately, because the life of the patient can be in danger with any medication errors. So depending on your institution's policy, you may also need to inform the relatives of the patient as to what went wrong and how the error was managed. A research from the University of Michigan showed that the more the families are informed about an error, the less that they are like, uh, the less likely they are going to react legally. So you need to inform the healthcare team, the hospital, and even the patient and the family members of what has happened. Or else we are putting our licenses on the line if we have or if we haven't reported the error in medication immediately. Your conscience should be at work here. Be honest. If you have committed an error, we all should be honest about it. They can sometimes happen. It is inevitable. It is unavoidable. So we just need to report it and we'll see what the hospital, the family is going to do about it. And for number seven, check for antidotes. The wrong drug and route can pose fatal risks to your patient. Some incidents can even lead to a loss, uh, to loss of lives, particularly if not handled correctly. So this makes preparation and readiness critical. Aside from emergency drugs, have the basic antidotes on stock. Keeping them within easy reach will enable you to respond quicker to emergent cases. Let's say, for example, you're at the surgery ward, and it's very, very common for doctors surgeons to prescribe narcotic analgesics as post-op medications for patients. Now, if there, are, there, if there was a medication error that was committed, take for example, you have given um, a dosage that was more, more than what was prescribed, this can put the patient at risk because there are certain narcotic analgesics that can cause respiratory depression. So these are certain uh, common drugs. Let's say, for example, at the surgical ward, make sure that you have a stock 
of antidotes that will help resist the adverse effects of narcotic analgesics such as Narcan. Narcan is the brand name, Naloxone is the generic name. Or you're at the OB ward, OBGYN ward, you are attending to patients who have pregnancy-induced hypertension. One of the common drugs given to PIH or pregnancy-induced hypertension is to the administration of magnesium sulfate. And magnesium is used to treat PIH. It can be toxic if uh, toxicity occurs. That's why it's our nursing responsibility to check for magnesium toxicity by assessing for the deep tendon reflexes because if the deep tendon reflex is absent or if there is hyporeflexion, we need to give the antidote for magnesium sulfate. Any calcium supplements can do. You will learn more about those once we go to or once we discuss those drugs. So that's it, guys, with regards to the principles of drug administration. If you have any questions about my lecture for today, please do not hesitate to contact me. Our next discussion for pharmacology would be all about drug computations. So please read in advance with regards to drug computations and practice them as well. So again, guys, thank you very much for listening for today's lecture. We'll, I'll be looking forward to having or practicing with you guys about drug dosage calculations. Have a great day, guys. Bye.